Hello, this is Pastor Jay with Walk Truth Radio Podcast and Senior Pastor of Walk and True Christian Fellowship Church. I always get a question. How do I find you other than Facebook? Well, all you have to do from your smartphone or computer is Google Walk in Truth Radio, Dr. James Sutton. And there will be many platforms to listen to the broadcast from. You pick the one that you enjoy. We are on every podcast platform. If you go to your favorite podcast platform and just search Walk in Truth Radio, you'll see the footprint and that's us. You can subscribe there or simply Google us and listen to the latest broadcast of Walk in Truth Radio where we teach the Bible line by line and verse by verse. So again, Google Walk in Truth Radio with Dr. James Sutton and look for the icon of the footprint in the sand. Peace. Hello, this is Pastor Jay with Walk in Truth Radio Podcast. And today's Bible study lesson is coming from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It's about being secure in your salvation. God gives us six things that we should feel secure in because we're saved. And the most important one is that we've made peace with God through Jesus and that we have eternal salvation due to his life. So enjoy today's Bible study. I'm always praying for you. Thank you and be blessed. Peace. God bless you and welcome to Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church broadcast. We appreciate and welcome all of you, our listeners around the world. Stay tuned to hear an exciting word from pastor teacher, Dr. James Sutton. chapter 5 again. So we're going to start at verse 1. And I'm, there's a lot of things, like I said, I know that we go over it, but there's a lot in Romans that you just can't go over it the first time because there's a lot of narrative, a lot of things you should learn. And I want to make sure that you learn them all as much as I can teach them. Um, so far in Romans, we covered the fact that, bottom line, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, we, we've covered that. Their man's problem is sin. That's what we talked about Sunday. Man's problem is sin. It is not the fruit that you see or the act of any particular sin, but not only the innate sin that we're born with and that we're shaped in, but also the choices that we make. We are enemies of God. We're not mad at God. God is mad at us. God is upset with us because we violated Adam did in the garden. And his biggest violation was not necessarily that he didn't take care of Eve. And her violation was not necessarily the apple itself, but what they thought would happen through the devil tricking them. They wanted to be like God. And that's the biggest violation you can have. That's blasphemy. God had provided everything that they needed. And gave them one prohibition. And the devil said, oh, you, you, sure, you sure God said what he said? And he said, you know what? The day you eat, you'll be like him. Who wouldn't be attracted to that? Most people, most people would. That's true. You telling me if I do this, I'm going to be like the most high God? Of course. The Tower of Babel, same thing. If you read it carefully, they were trying to get to God to be like God. Man's problem is he wants to be his own God. So the God was, we have enmity with God. Then God provided a way of reconciliation through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, what we have to distinguish is the Jew versus the church. That's a whole different relationship. And people have mailed it together, and it's going to take me years to, to get you guys, again, to understand there is a difference in relationship. The Bible calls it the mystery. The church is the mystery. The Jewish nation is not a mystery. 90% of the Bible was written to the Jewish nation for the Jews, for their reconciliation back 
to God. But then there's the church, which is the body of Christ. The Jews are never called the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ, the Gentile nation, and some Jews that will accept him. The issue is law versus grace. The church is under grace, and that's how we come into by grace through faith that we say the Jewish nation is still working on trying to come in through the law. And the law only points out their ability not to be able to do it. For the past 2,000 years, they have not been able to be holy enough to come in under the law. You might keep 10, but the Bible tells us that if you break one, you've broken them all. And the wages of breaking God's law is death, separation and death. So the Jews need to understand that through the law that they were given, they were supposed to live at a higher standard to show how good God was. And when you read the Old Testament, you just really see the mercy and the grace of God in the Jewish nation. No matter how bad they sinned, he always redeemed them. Yes, he did. And they did nothing to deserve redemption. He just said, enough is enough. I promised Abraham, because his promise, that's the thing, God is faithful. And, and for you as Gentile believers, you have to believe God is faithful. That's why we're saved apart from the law. And that is so mysterious and so deep that you can spend a lifetime unpacking the grace and the mercies of God. The deeper you go in God, the more you understand how gracious God is. That's why he says, don't you understand? No, we don't. The goodness of God should lead us to repent. We think of it in a superficial type of way, but how deep is that statement that God is so good that it leads you to a position of mind changing, metanoia, repentance. And then you have this renewed mind. Our relationship with God is not, see, I'm going to say this so you can understand this. It's, and, and we say this in Christian and Western society, kingdom building. There is no kingdom to be built. Where do y'all get that from? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. So that means his kingdom is already built somewhere else. He can't be a king without a kingdom. So it's already, he already has a kingdom. And if anybody's going to build his kingdom, it's going to be him. You, 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 you don't build. See, that's that works thing. That's it's psychologically, you try to do what the Jews do. You want to build another temple. But God says, the Holy Spirit live in you. You the temple. So there's nothing external to build. Everything that God's doing in the church is internal. And when you kind of make that shift, so then, so the mystery is the Jews, Gentiles. And Romans was written to Gentiles. Ephesians was written to Gentiles. Galatians was written to Gentiles. And you have to remember, in the church, you have a mixture of pagan and Jew coming in under faith and grace. Not coming in under law. Not coming in under a work. Not coming in under the religious system. And the system of grace is, like I said, it's so powerful that it's like, why do we do good? Because God has been so gracious. How can we do good works? Because God has been so gracious. How is he gracious? He gave us his son. And in his son, we walk and breathe and do. So Romans is, 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 is Paul's exposition on going for him. We couldn't have a relationship with God. We had to have a redeemer. And the redeemer came. And in chapter 4, it tells us we're saved by grace through faith. That's how we are saved. Now our problem is, our next logical problem is, how are we secure? What are we secure in and how we should look at security? Most of you don't understand that you should be secure in Christ. You cannot lose your salvation because if it was, you could lose your salvation, then think about this. It wouldn't be salvation. <laughs> salvation means I'm saved. So if you can lose your saved, then how do you get it back? If you didn't work to get it, then why are you going to work to get it? What are you going to do to get it back? You're not going to receive any more grace. See that? And that's not our problem. We just want to believe that somebody, we want to say, they can lose it, we're going to have it. They bad, we good. You know, I had somebody sitting right, I was sitting right there, I was talking somebody Sunday afternoon, and I asked them a question about, uh, where this particular group of Christians, and they said, yeah, and they didn't want, and they said the, 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 the line that I like the best that Joel Osteen said when he was confronted on Larry King's show, he said, Joel Osteen said, the lady confronted him, that's why I love uh, Christian women, because y'all just gonna say it. So she said, 
Joel, I love your, your sermons, but uh, you haven't once said Jesus Christ is the only way. And this person said like, Joel, well, I'm not going to say that this group is not going to go to hell. And I would never say this group, not any group is not going to go to hell. So I said, well, let me ask you this. And I said, what determines that group going to hell or not? Well, they're devout. They do good works. They nice people. Wow. And I said, so your criteria for salvation is you're devout. I said, that just means you're devoted. You can be devoted to some wrong stuff. You don't have to be devoted to to right stuff. You can be devoted to something wrong. I, I'm a witness to that. I've been devoted to some stuff that's going to send me to hell. Okay? So I'm just saying, is that your criteria? But he, but then he was trying to use scripture. He said, well, the Bible says judge, not lest you be judged. I said, then he couldn't even quote it right. Because we don't want to look at the fact that we take stuff out of context and we don't understand what that means. Because actually, in that scripture, that's the scripture that goes into, if you read in context, talks about removing the thing from your brother's eye before you move from yours. It doesn't say don't judge. It says before you do, make sure you judge a righteous judgment, which is the word of God. Like I told him, I took him to scripture. I said, okay, this is what you say. This is what scripture says. Your argument is not with me. Your argument is with scripture. And if you don't believe in the scripture, then you're not saved. Because you can't get to Romans 10 and 9 until we go through all the stuff that takes you to 10 and 9. Amen. So our goal is we're, we're going towards 10 and 9, but I, it's a methodical way that, wrote, that he wrote in Romans that gets us to 10 and 9. We can't come to God. We're totally depraved. God does us a favor and sends us Jesus because he loves us and he wants to save us. Amen. You didn't do nothing to deserve his saving. But his salvation only works for those who would believe. It's only affection. It can say, God's sacrifice of his son is enough to save the whole world. But as long as there are parts of the world that won't believe, it doesn't be, do them any good. But I want you to feel secure in your salvation. So let's go to Romans chapter 5. Rita, you going to be able to do this? Yes. Okay, Romans chapter 5. We're going to take it real slow. Romans chapter 5. Now, we're looking for security. We just got off Therefore, so therefore means that he's saying now, therefore, that you know that you saved by grace through faith, that you know that he sacrificed for you, that you know that 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 faith and grace is the way you're saved. Therefore, and I'm then look at verse one, read. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, mm -hmm. we have peace with God through Go ahead. through our Lord Jesus Christ. So first verse. You should be secure in your salvation because by our Lord Jesus Christ, we have what with God? Peace. 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 The war is over. Hallelujah. The war is over. Hallelujah. You have peace with God. That's your first thing that you should be secure in. The Bible says you have peace with God. There is no more enmity with God in you. Through our Lord and Jesus Christ and your faith in him and his finished work on the cross, you have gained peace. So the first thing I want to say is you, you, you cool with God now. And God cool with you. Now, is it based on the work that you do? Nope. It's based on the faith that you have. Yes. See, that's the mystery. Because normally when we cool with somebody, they have to do something. But you don't repent until after you get saved. Because it's this goodness that drives you to repentance and your faith in what he done on your cross that says you should be a sinner and now you are saved. See, his goodness drives you to that repentance. So your faith in, in what he's done on the cross is so important. So that's one. Why are you secure? You, should, you got peace with God. Two, what's the second verse? Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace by which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Stop. So therefore, right? Here we go. Through what? Through him. Who was him? Jesus. Okay, we have also what? Obtained what? Yeah. Access. Access. So the one reason why you secure through faith, you got what? Access. Access. And that really means you have this, this, this unfettered way to get to God. There's nothing blocking you. You have access. Just like you take your key and open your door to your car, you have access. There's nothing, no one that's locking you out. You say, you can, I can prove that. When the Bible says there's neither, there's either... Well, uh, a life nor death 
no angel, no principality, no things, no things present, no things to come. That part in Romans 8 that will separate you from the love of God. What it means is that there's nothing that, that separates you from access. Not even the angels that's in charge of principalities. They're, they're the powerful angels. Those are the ones who to, to try to rule over governments. They can't even stop you. There's nothing in creation that stops you from having access once you come to Christ. So you should be securing that. You have peace and you have access. Go ahead. And you rejoice, right? What you rejoice in is all through Jesus. It's not through you. So that means, Sister Jackie, I can't take it away from you. There's nobody in this room because they're a created thing, right? So there's no created thing that can take it away from you because you are plugged in and have peace with the eternal God. You have access and you have peace. All right? And you rejoice in that. Access and peace. Go ahead. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So now... We go one step further. We have peace. We have access. And because we have peace and we have access to God. Now we're going to have suffer, which we call persecution. And because we have this peace and because we have this access and because we're the church and because we're the body, we're going to suffer. Not only continue to suffer due to the decay of the body, but also suffer persecution. And we wear and we wear persecution like a badge of honor. When someone is talking about you and someone is coming against you negatively, and society's not allowing us to freely be Christians, we wear that persecution as a badge of honor. There are some Christians around this world that are facing a gun right now to their head if they don't renounce Jesus. It hasn't happened here yet, but it's coming. It's coming. Every time we turn around, it's always something against the body of Christ. Because people don't want that access. They don't, it, it, they don't want this God that forgives. I don't understand that, but this God forgives. And he forgives on his own terms. And all he wants you to do is come to him on his terms, not yours. So we, so we now, in, the, in our sufferings, we don't just suffer to suffer. We rejoice in our sufferings because sufferings build something. Go ahead. And endurance produces character. Mm -hmm. And character produces hope. Now stop. So in our sufferings, that gives us endurance. What is endurance? The ability to stand, withstand, and fight on. So our suffering builds something. And endurance builds what? Character. character. What is character? Character is the way of life. What you think. How you respond. You don't respond like everybody else. You shouldn't. You should have the character of Christ in you. Let this mind be in you that's also in who? Christ Jesus. You build your character by being in Christ Jesus. You build your character by being in the word of God. Your character is your day to day. Is your word your bond? Do you still lie? Do you still steal? Do you still cheat? Who are you out there? Versus in here. Are you the same? Or is there a little difference in you where people's wondering if you are even part of the body of Christ or not? If I would talk to some of your friends that, that, that don't know me and I could get about three of them, would they say that they know you a child of God? <clears throat> or would they say, I didn't think they was in church. Let alone say, because yesterday we were doing whatever and they didn't say nothing. Matter of fact, they were leading us in that debauchery. And the Romans talked about that too. You condemn other people, but you also do the same thing. That's what makes you a hypocrite. I'm not saying, but you know, your, your, your daily, you're, not, you're, gonna, you're going to sin, you're going to fall, but is that a pattern for you? Do you rely on the fact that you've fallen? You know, do you just accept the fact that God knows that you're going to fall and you say, well, God knows I'm going to fall. <laughs> that goes back to the verse where it said that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, and then they say, as they should be condemned in sin, that we should sin so grace can abound. But you don't let the fact that grace abounds in sin give you a license to sin. That's where these people want to take us when they say you're going to lose your salvation. They just can't phantom that you would even try to do right under grace. Then they can't phantom that grace is so good that it'll motivate you to, to a renewed mind. You need the threat of that you're going to lose your sin. Well, if you think about that, the penal system right now, has the death penalty stopped anybody from doing crazy stuff? No. Nope. 
Because man is so inherently evil, he don't care about dying. Because most of them don't believe that there's a, a hell to go to. So if they don't believe that, that, that's one trick of the devil. The devil can get you not to believe that there's a hell. He got you. So having a death penalty don't mean anything. It doesn't deter anything. It don't stop anything. It's just like taking the weapons away from, from law-abiding citizens. That's not going to stop anything because the crooks have them. Crook don't go to the store and buy a weapon. He gets it, he gets it stolen. See, they, they think all, more laws help. No. What a help is we repent and get on our knees before Jesus. That would help us as a nation. Not another law written by man. Okay? Go ahead. And hope does not put us to shame mm -hmm. because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So now the hope doesn't put us to shame. Well, the hope is in the gospel. Remember Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of salvation. Okay, so your hope is in the gospel and what it does. And it will not put you to shame. Meaning that what? It won't let you down. The gospel of Christ will not let you down. That's why there's such a great penalty if you preach another gospel. He said, if you preach any other gospel than what I preach, you are accursed. And then he said it twice. He said, I'm going to say again, if, the, if, a, if anybody, an angel, anybody preach another gospel, you are accursed because the gospel is the power. If you can, if you can tell somebody the gospel, you are giving them the power. You are giving them the access. So there's nothing to be ashamed of by telling the hard truth of the gospel. Okay? The gospel is good enough for everyone. And it can save everyone if they would believe in it. If they just would believe in it. And this thing where God is poured out. It's not like drops. That word is like lavish. Like continual pouring like a river. That, that part in John where we talk about the rivers of living water. That's how God is pouring out his love on you continuously going river. It's not drip, drip, drip. It's just such lavish love. So much love that you can't even handle it half the time. Because you can't phantom a, 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 a love that loves you to the point that they will give up their son. You can't handle a love that satisfies your, that satisfies your, your disobedience to God that brings peace. You can't, you can't handle a love that no matter what happens, He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the love that's so deep that we can't handle it. If you, when I think about this love, that's the way we do what we do. And we can't handle love that tells us he loved us first. See, I can handle it if I got a part in it. I can handle it if, he had, if I had to do something. But I can't handle it because he loved me first. The only bad, only bad part about that is, and I'm being facetious, he got the nerve to say he is love. My God, don't I don't I fit in there somewhere? Yeah, just receive. But can I? No, my religious activity. No, I don't. No, it's like when I train preacher. I do. I tell him to do certain things, and when he get ready to do something, I say no. But Daddy, I want to know. You don't have to get up. You can sit there. You can relax. And that's what I want you to be secure in your, your salvation. God has given us reasons to relax. He pours out his love lavishly on you. You don't have to do nothing to look for God's love. Just receive it. Now, it may manifest itself in many different ways, but remember, it's always there. There's no stopping his lavish love for you. What happens is you turn your back on the love. Because the love is not a willy-nilly love. A will love is not that he give you everything you want. His love is accountable and responsible to what he has for you in his will. And his will, as we know, don't line up with our own will all the time. We want stuff. We want God to bless, bless us with health. We want God to bless us with this. We want God to bless us. And really all we need to do to look around and get God's blessing is appreciate his love. I mean, manifesting little stuff at a time that's interesting. And I thank God for showing me that. But I never take the stuff that is manifested for the good of my flesh <coughs> at the limit of his love. Because I'm so glad my soul is saved. 
I am glad that my soul is saved. So we're looking at the love. Read the next verse. What verse are we on? Six. Six, okay. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Stop right there. For while you were still a sinner, Christ died. So at the right time, he showed up. He takes it out of your hands. But that's why you're secure, because it was at the right time. God died for sinners. And I, and I keep trying to tell you, the day of wrath came and God, Jesus, on the cross. Thank God he was on the cross to take the wrath of God for you and me. Not only are you saved, you're, you're saved in the, in the, from, the, from the past, you're being saved and you will always be saved. And God did all of that on the cross for you. While you were weak, you couldn't come to him. You was enemies with him. You didn't, you didn't love him. You didn't care for him. You shook your fist at him. And he was upset with you too. But then at the right time, he sent his son. Mm -hmm. So when God shows up at the right time, you should feel secure. When God shows up at the right time in your life, in the time that you need him the most, you should know that he's secure. And, and, and what's great about it is you call it showing up. He's always been there. It's just that the scales are falling from your eyes. You can see now. He's always been with me. He's all, but at the right time, he saved each and every one in this room under certain conditions that only people we can turn to is him. Go ahead, seven. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, mm -hmm. though perhaps for a good person, one would even one would dare even to die. Mm -hmm. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us. Now think about this. What he does is making the human turn. He say, look, if you believe I'm righteous, you might die for me. And you believe she good, you might consider to die. But while we were still yet sinners, all of us, because none of us were righteous. <laughs> no, not one. And none of us are good but God. But he's going to put it in you like you would like to see it. Like that person said to me, well, this person, do this, this group do good works. And that's, you know, that I'll never say. No, he's saying, he's trying to be kind of funny. He's like, yeah, I know that you would consider it, but guess what? You wouldn't. But guess what? Nobody's righteous. Nobody's good. And Jesus died. Why what? While we were still yet sinners. That's why you should be secure. Because he didn't die based upon you doing any good. He died while you were still weak. He died while you were still in bondage. He died while you were still under the influence of the devil. Your father. He died so that you'd be reconciled back to him. Nothing you bring to the table. But you take away everything. And that's the mystery the angels cannot understand. Who is this creature? Who is this, this creature that you say that you love? We're, what, why? And they're sinners. How is it that they're going to judge us? And we've served you. How is you going to judge us? And, and we're, we have superpowers. How is it that they going to judge us? Because, and how do you, why do you call them your body? That's the mystery. That's our mystery. How is their life hidden in you? That's the mystery. The Bible tells us the angels look to see this mystery but don't understand it. That's why I say your relationship with God is so much better than the Jewish nation. Because the Jewish nation is still waiting on the king. We accept this kingship. We're waiting on a husband. Amen. We're his bride. And being a bride, there's a different relationship than just a king and a subject. He even told him, I'm going to call you my friend. But the church is something that's, that's, that's so weird because it's a new creation. It's a new creature. See, you're not the old creature because if you was the old creature, you'd be the Jewish nation. You're a new creature. Amen. And this creature doesn't function under the law because he fulfills the law and you believe in what he did to cross makes you a new creation, new, new creation, new being, new. You become his body. The Jewish nation is not his body. The Jewish nation is God promising Abraham through the years of what his, that nation is going to be. And that all the prophecy of the Jewish nation has to happen. It has nothing to do with you. 
but you meld it together and the pastors and stuff and meld together. That's why you have, that's why you're so schizophrenic when it comes to this. Because one minute you're on grace, the next minute you're on works. One minute you're on grace, the next minute you're on works. You don't know what you're going to do. But this is tell you, this, what we read from verse 5 1 has nothing, doesn't it say you do anything. He's done everything. And you got a problem with that. I got a problem with that. I got a problem with God doing everything. Well, man, I got to do something. Do something. Just believe. No, I want to work. Because you know what? I can outwork you. So I want to say, look at her and look at me. And the Bible clearly tells us don't judge each other like that. But we like to. It's so subtle because when you once you get into my spirit, you'll bring it to me and it's so subtle. Well, look at so-and-so, what they doing. What they got to do with you. Right. You don't know what kind of assignment I got them on or God got them on. They ain't none of your business. You should be praying. Whatever you think they're not doing, why don't you just go ahead and pray for them? If I ain't can't bother to them, maybe I know something you don't know. So, girl, they can't handle me not being a nosy pastor. They really can't. They want me to be, they want me to be, they've been so bad. Because that's what they used to. I mean, it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying, you want freedom in this body, this work, this worship. We are free. I believe in the liberty of God. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe he's going to teach you. I'm just a voice box for God. After that, as long as I know I'm teaching you the truth, guess who I turn you over to? The Holy Ghost. I ain't got to beat up on you. I ain't worried about what you're doing. Sitting at home stressed out. I wonder why so and so didn't come to church. What they got to do with me? That's between them and God. You know why you didn't come. And I don't want you to feel guilty about not coming. If you at peace with it, I'm at peace with it, and God is surely gonna be at peace with it. And that makes me say you're responsible for your own relationship with God. I'm not your intercessor. I'm not your intercede. I can intercede for you in prayer, but God says there's only one meteor between man and God, and his name is Jesus. You don't need to go with no angels. Why would you go with an angel when you got the Holy Ghost in you? Because you want you want these mystical things in between you, and you know you go to these deliverance services. And then my thing is this: if you got the Holy Ghost in you and the Word of God in front of you. Why you got to go to an external place to get delivered? The woman at the well got delivered because she talked to Jesus. The woman called the adultery got exonerated because she was dealing with Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm going to send back a helper to deal with you and it's going to be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be my representative to you so that I'm sitting on the right hand side of God interceding for you and everything. Even you don't even know to pray right and I'm interceding on that. And you want to go to some man and have him throw some monkey oil on you <laughs> and some water on you and push you down on the ground and speak tongues over you. And you really think that Joe, what you're dealing with God is external. If you don't, if you don't have a prayer life, if you don't have a, a time with God, that's your problem. You don't need to go to another service. You need to spend some time with God outside of service. Some alone time with God so he can deal with you. 90% of the Christians, we don't pray like, do you know? And I'm not going to say it again. When I say this, think I'm thinking, you know, I'm speaking to a whole bunch of people and I'm speaking this in this church. But the reason why we can do what we do because somebody praying in this church. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Somebody praying for this body. Somebody praying for this pastor. Somebody praying. And I know I'm praying. I know some other people praying. So that's why we can do what we do. Amen. It's not because we're so smart and so bright and so good. It's because we got a prayer life. And if made your church stop having a prayer life and your pastor can't lead you in prayer, you're not in church no more. Amen. You're not in church no more. You don't understand this thing of we being saved while we were still yet sinners. It's only through a prayer life that I can understand and appreciate him saving me. And I'm securing my salvation because what we read so far. Go ahead, read. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, mm -hmm. much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. See? So since, therefore, that means everything up above it. 
Since everything else we read from five down, five one down to now is true, we are justified even the more. How much more are we going to be justified by his blood? You are secure. There's nothing that can take away the blood of Jesus from you. It has nothing to do with what you're going to do next. But I tell you, your prayer life will do so much better for your understanding. Because the prayer life will open you up to understanding the scriptures. Because one of the things I hope you pray for is God, show me your word so I can understand. It. Just be quick. Lord, Lord, if I don't catch nothing, give me just a little bit. I might not catch everything pastors say. But let me catch something that I can hold on to. That's you. When I listen to all them sermons, let me tell you, when I listen to all them sermons all day, I listen to a whole bunch of them, I can't take this, take this, nuggets, nuggets. I don't catch the whole thing. I'm at a point now where I do understand what's being said, but, but, but I'm looking for the nugget. I'm looking for the nugget. I'm looking for that thing. Okay. Just like when I just told you about lavishly being poured out on you. This, 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 you know, when we say lavish, we don't understand the level of lavish. That means it's like a constant river being poured. Then it was told to me in a, in a sermon that this, this is, goes with our scripture. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So this God is showing his love and pouring into you and you're pouring out to the people and you're not basing upon what they do, what they've done, what they believe. You just give it to them straight. You don't sugarcoat it. You tell them the truth in love. So when I was confronted because I'm secure, when I was talking to the brother about this, I told him, I said, well, I know devout Muslims <laughs> that are good people that I would eat with. I said, but they're not saved. And I said, yes, they're going to hell. And the group you're talking about is going to go to hell. I'm not judging them. The word judges them. The Bible says in, in, in John 18 that you condemned already because you don't believe. So I'm not, you know, the condemnation is, you may be hearing me saying it, but the word, I'm using the word to, to tell what, what, and I say, guess what I've learned? When you tell people the truth, they can get saved. Amen. But when you backdoor them, trauma, about, well, come here, our choir. Well, come here, our cake bake. Come here, come watch us do outreach. That's works. That don't save nobody. And if they get too much into doing the work, you'll never get them back to salvation. Because how are you going to get them all full of cake and candy and popcorn and then tell them, well, you got to die spiritual diabetes and you need to repent and get saved. What you mean? You didn't tell me that in the beginning. You want your security? Repent. Yes, ma'am. Lady at work, and she a Jehovah's Witness. She said she can't sign that this card because somebody passed away because it's a cross on. They don't believe in the cross. What's... That's just that. Well, I mean, I mean, the thing about it is, see that's see that's silliness, yeah. and this is what I mean by that. Yeah. The, does the they they? But see, you pick and choose. Okay, they ain't signing a cross, but they do believe in drinking and having a good time. Okay, so 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 which one is worse? You signing a card to somebody else that has a cross on it, or you out here doing stuff that the Bible clearly tells us not to do? Okay, and that's the saddest part about man's religion. Because man religion pick out every man that created a religion, picked out what they wanted to pick out, and then said, Here it is. Baptists did it, Catholics did it. But the problem is, you when you live under these laws, you got to take in the law. You become almost a Jew because you're saying, I can't do something because it has a cross on it. Well, my point is this. What does a cross got to do with your salvation? That's on a piece of paper. You're not worshiping the cross because you sign, hey, I feel that somebody's sick or something like that. Come on. But that's true. But see, that's how sick we are in religion. So she, now think about it. She's going to take to God one day and say, Well, God, you know I love you. I just signed something that had a cross on it. She's going to be like, Huh? <laughs> well, that's how I know I'm saved because I just signed it when it had a cross on it. I just signed a bereavement card because it had a cross on it. He said, You have the liberty to do that. But if that bothers your conscience, I'm glad you didn't. But don't think you get any credit for not signing a card. Right. We don't get any credit for signing it. And they don't get no credit for not signing it. We're just being nice people. You know, the, the, the thing about it is, as long as, this is what I'm going to tell you, saints. If it bothers your conscience, don't do it. The Bible teaches that clearly. 
If it bothers your conscience, don't do it. If you think it's sin, the Bible says, if you know to do good and don't do it, it's sin. And the reverse of that is, if you think it's sin, don't do it. Work it out with God. I mean, unless it's specifically in the Bible, work it out with God. Like God doesn't tell us who married, who not to marry, right? It just warns us and gives us a kind of a warning, don't be unevenly yoked. But you still can go out and marry somebody. Anybody you want to. It's just that I can't marry you. But you can go to the courthouse and do everything you want to do. And there's no reason to be counseling you. If you want secular counseling, go on the internet and get it. But if you're not a Christian and you sit next to a person that want to marry you and they're a Christian, I'm, I'm trying to get that person saved so y'all can be yoked in salvation. And until I get that person saved, there's no point in me talking about do y'all like green? Or what side of the bed you like to sleep on? All that stuff that don't make a difference. Because you're unevenly yoked. You're pulling in two different directions. One work for the devil, one work for God. And nine times out of ten when it is happening, and, and, I, and that's the part I don't like. I'm going to say I don't like it. A little leaven leavens a whole lot. It's not that the good person never gets the good. The gospel changes that person. But normally when you yoke up with somebody that's a sinner, you fall back. I'm a witness. You fall back. Yeah, you think you're trying to, well, I'm trying to save them. All they do is bring you deeper back in. And now you can't get them to come to salvation because they're looking at you like a hypocrite. Because actually, yeah, yeah, you you done fell back. You ain't strong enough. That's why the Bible tells us to flee fornication. You ain't supposed to sit there and pray over it and deal with it and hey, answer the phone and get to the house and had a meal and sitting on the bed, then decide to run. It's too late then. Your pastor do real talk. I'm talking real talk with y'all. It's too late then. When it, if somebody got your number. Don't answer their phone call. Amen. Look at it and click. Look, mute. Because your mind is already going like your body's saying, go on and answer that phone. You know you want to go. No, no, no. But you got the you got the surrender to the Holy Ghost in you and say it's better for me. For instance, I'm, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a little small instance, then, then we almost done. Yesterday, yesterday, I could have ordered a pizza. And I want a pizza. Now, in my refrigerator, I have chili, I have turkey. I have bologna, I have ghost pepper cheese, I have sardines, I have I have an array, I have my curry chicken, but I'm going to order pizza. Now I'm sitting there and I didn't dial the thing twice. And hold up each thing. Because I know I ain't got no business order, no pizza with all this food in here. Okay? Well, that's money, hold on, that's a 20 that can stay in my pocket. Okay? I didn't order it, but I think about people in their salvation with the, when they deal with the devil like that. It's like, it's the same thing. You got God. You got godly brothers and sisters. Why are you keep dialing that emo's pizza number? And then I had to just put the phone down and walk away. And go in there and eat the food I'm supposed to eat. Now, did it satisfy the flesh desire for the pizza? No. But I was glad I was able to d discipline myself to walk away. Because let me tell you something. Once you start disciplining yourself to do things yeah. like that, yeah. it'll spill over to the holy life. Amen. Your holy life. Amen. Amen. It's, yeah. You got to do the little bitty things like that. And then, no, I ain't going to do that. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. The Holy Ghost tells you to don't. The Holy Ghost say to me sometimes, don't you, you know what's going on. Don't intervene in their lives. Let, the, let me do this. Just like I did Sunday with you. Remember I said, what's going on? You know that normally trigger a phone call to me at church. Yeah. But the Holy Ghost said, leave them alone. They grown. Mm -hmm. You ain't got nothing to do with that. You, that they need to figure that out. Yeah. You, didn't talk, you didn't talk to them until you was green in the face. <laughs> he know the word, she know the word. I'm done. Back off. Back off. All right, one more verse and we're done. Mm-hmm. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So it tells, it tells you no matter what you've done, once you come to Christ, and one, you were enemies, and he saved you while you were still a sinner, how much more should you be secure by the fact that he lives? 
God, Jesus lives, he'll never die again. He died once for sinners. And all you got to do is believe. Believe it. If you can just get the, get the magnitude of that, you'll see the, 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 the you'll see it just open up to you like, I ain't got to live under law no more. I live under grace. And grace motivates me to do good. I don't need the law to tell me not to do it. I got God who died for me that I love. And he loved me while I still get a sinner. He loved me enough to go to the cross and take on my sin. And all I got to do, I'm, I'm free. You're free from sin. No, does it say no? You, anytime that you sin, you, you reattach yourself. Before you was attached. But the shackles have been broken. The Bible says, let sin have no more dominion over you. That means control over you. It's there, but it should not have that, that, that unrelenting control over you where you are in power that you cannot say no to it. Because you got a stronger power in you if you say. If you ain't saved, you don't have nothing to clue what I'm talking about. And if, and if you ain't saved, you're still trying to work at it. Come here and listen to me. Don't get you saved. What gets you saved is listen to the fact that we preach the gospel. Because it is the power of the salvation. And all those who preach and teach. You don't have to have a title to give somebody the gospel. All you have to do is have the gospel in you because you've been saved. And that's how you go out and make disciples of Jesus. You tell them the gospel. You give your testimony how you got saved. If you got one. Some of you don't have no testimony. When I ask people how they say it, they get to telling me the historical narrative about their granny and them. That ain't salvation. Nope. That's just a historical narrative of their salvation. Right. Nope. You can't get on your, you, you ones who have husbands who, who, who sit on the fence or not, they not sit on the fence, they not saved. Mm. You got boyfriends and girlfriends who sit on the fence and saying, hey, you know, I'm in the room with women. You know, I'm not saying, you know, in a weird way, but it's going out to people. If you got, if you got associates and, and, and this one lady asked me, I mean, I, I don't know her. Matter of fact, you know what I'm talking about. You know what you referred. I mean, she saved. But the lust in her was so strong that she wants to be with somebody who's unsaved. And let me tell you what this season is called. From October 31st to February 14th, it's called cuffing season. Please go listen to my show on cuffing season. This is this is that season. Cuffing season. It's a real definition. Okay? Where this is where you ladies. They smell you. You're like blood in the water. Dun -a, dun -a, dun -a, dun -a. And, and these men are lurking. Because you don't want to walk in the Christmas party by yourself. You don't want to be you don't want to be Thanksgiving by yourself. You don't want to be with Christmas by yourself. You don't want to be with New Year's Eve by yourself. And you don't want to be on February 14th by yourself. So you smell it. You hang, you hanging out with your friends, going to the clubs in the happy hours. And y'all all dialed up, looking good in your red Christmas stuff. And the sharks are going, mm -hmm. which one I'm going to find today? And, 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 and exchange your phone numbers lead to some coffee. Coffee lead to some dinner. Dinner lead to a movie. And movie may lead to some shoes being under your bed. and ain't got no business. And then you wonder why all of a sudden you buying him everything. And he's buying you nothing. But you want him there. This is your boo. And you don't even know him really. And then next thing you know, when the cuff is season over with, he dropped you and you wonder what didn't happen. Well, he just was out on the prowl. You in season like their season. Okay? So just remember that. Okay? Let's pray. Oh, Grace Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we know that we are secure by his life. We thank you that we have peace. We thank you that we can rejoice in our suffering. We thank you that your blood has covered us and saved us, that there's nothing that we bring to the table, nothing that we can do other than believe, Lord. Teach us how to have faith. Teach us how to believe. Teach us to have great faith, not in ourselves, but in what you've done. Lord, let the Holy Spirit control us and guide us during this time. Lord, let us be able to talk to young people about this dangerous time of cuffing season. They may hook up with somebody, end up with something they don't really want, be it a child or a disease, all because their flesh is driving them because they want to be with somebody. And Lord, let's encourage them to be with the Lord. 
get past this. And Lord, it is not only cuffing season. It, it, this may be the way somebody's been living their life. Young lady or man, they always got to be with somebody. Never ever been alone. Went from their mama's house to somebody else's house. Not in marriage, but just they want to be with somebody. Lord, I ask that those who are living this way, that they wake up and decide one day that maybe there's another way. That it may be painful to the flesh, but it's good to the spirit. Lord, I pray for those. I don't condemn them. I pray for them. Because these are your saved folk that are like this. When you talk about the heathen, these are saved sisters and brothers in Christ that are going through the roughest time of their life right now in their emotions and their feelings and their flesh, Lord. And I just ask you to cover them with that power, with that salvation power. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Hello, this is Pastor Jay with Walker Truth Radio Podcast and Senior Pastor of Walker Truth Christian Fellowship Church. I want to invite all those in the St. Louis metropolitan area to come worship with us every Sunday at 8 a.m. at the Universal Church of Jesus Christ building located at 2301 Wallace Avenue. That's W-A-L-L-I-S Avenue 63114 in Overland, Missouri. Our Dig Deeper Bible Studies are held 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. Our Rescue Addiction Recovery class is being held at 7 p.m. on Mondays. We want you to come enjoy the love of God, worship with us, and go line by line and verse by verse as we travel through the Bible. We look forward to seeing you, and one of the things you can leave at home is your wallet. We want you to come sit back, enjoy the fellowship, the love, and the great teaching that goes on at Walking Truth. This is Pastor Jay. I always want you to be encouraged to be blessed, and thank you for considering us as your place of worship. Hello, this is Pastor Jay. I'm excited to invite you to come over to listen to our broadcast on YouTube. Yes, Walk in True Christian Fellowship Church on YouTube. We have some great videos over there and you'll be able to listen to all the lessons and the podcast. So again, subscribe, like, and continue to comment and listen. This is Pastor Jay. Talk to you later. Peace.